Hi, chess friends, and welcome back. Thank you for being here. Today, I'm going to be going through a new video series uh, dedicated to studying endgames, part of Mark Divertisky's book, Divertisky's Endgame Manual, fourth edition. This is a really great book, and I highly recommend that you buy it. But of course, this video series will be detailing some of the exercises within that book, the key concepts, as well as my own take on some of the analysis. So let's get right to it. For today, I'm going to be exploring pawn endgames and specifically an important concept known as acquiring key squares. And key squares are those squares defined by which if we have possession of them, especially by the king in this case, then no matter whose move it is, we are assured victory. And so right now the king is sitting on the d5 square, but the d5 square isn't actually a critical square. Because in this case, in this position, uh, whose move it is does decide the outcome of the game. The king is, however, controlling key squares like e6, d6, and c6. So if it were to occupy those squares, then yes, white would be winning no matter whose move it is. So in this case, you can see that if black has the opposition, in which case it's white's king that is forced to move in this position, then this position is a draw because if white's king moves, say, to c5, black's king can move to c7, gaining the opposition once more. And of course, if white plays d5, black can play king to d7, and this will lead to a draw. However, if we do go back to this position yet again, if it is black's king that must move, especially to c7 or to e7, then white's king can then move to one of the key squares, c6, d6, or e6, and once it gains control of them, white will be winning this position. Knowing which key squares to occupy makes winning pawn endgames much, much easier. And so we're going to see this as well in the next position right here. In this position, you can see that white has control of key squares, c6, b6, a6, and is also exerting um, key influence over a7, b7, and c7. So no matter whose move it is in this position, white will win the game. Now, take a minute to try to think about what you would do here if it was white to play. Pause the video and see if you can find the solution. All right, so I'm assuming that you've taken some time to think through and understand uh, what white can do here. And if you were thinking the move king to a6, then you're absolutely correct. However, if, black, if white plays something like king to c6 here, black actually has a very nice response, which is king to a7. In which case, if white plays b6, then king to a8 leads to stalemate. Moving back, if we have king to a6 instead, then black's king is of course forced to move. If black's king moves to a8, white can play b6, and after b6, king to b8, b7, white will be winning this endgame. All right, so here we have another position, and this position is white to move. Uh, try to take a minute to see if you can find out whether this position is winning for white or if black has enough to make the draw. And of course, be sure to apply the idea of key squares. Can white get to a key square, in which case they can win this position, or will black make it in time so that they can secure a draw? All right, I take it that you've taken your minute to try to think about this position, so let's get through with it. So the first thing I see is that white's king needs to get to a key square such as a6, b6, or c6, correct? And so the first move is quite obvious for white to play here, king to c2 trying to get to one of those key squares. Black, of course, is going to try to get to one of those key squares and occupy it so white can't. So black plays king to e7. White continues with king to b3. Black plays king to d6. And white plays king to a4. Now notice, if white had played something like king to c4, then black can play king to c6, gaining the opposition, forcing white's king to move and making it extremely difficult, actually impossible for black to control, for white to control key squares like b6, a6, or c6. 
So that's why white opts for playing something like king to a4. So that after black plays king to c6, white continues with king to a5, forcing black to play king to b7, and then white plays king to b5. Now, in this position, white hasn't occupied a key square yet, but as we remember in the first position, white has gained the opposition, and so black's king will be forced to move, um, allowing white to occupy one of the key squares like b6, c6, or a6, thus winning the endgame. So let's take a look at this final position. Um, this position is white to move. And again, take one minute to, you know, just try to understand is white winning in this position or does black have enough to manage a draw? Again, think about the key squares that white's king wants to control, whether the white king can get there in time and what is the most effective plan to do that. So I take it you paused the video, thought about the position. And so let's see what happens. Now, in this position, of course, white wants to control key squares like g6, f6, and h6, correct? And so it's in white's best interest to try to get to those squares as quickly as possible. White also sees that the pawn on h5 is on the board. So if black's king can protect the pawn on h5, this position is also drawn. So white needs to somehow win the pawn on h5 and take control of these three critical squares. So therefore, white's next move, king to f2, is perfectly logical, trying to get the king to move to g3, h4, and win the pawn on h5. Of course, a move like king to g1, on the other hand, is too slow, as that allows black's king to come in and defend in time. So after king to f2, black can, of course, play king to d7, but this just goes along with white's plan and allows white to win this pawn on h5. So black has an opportunity to make life a lot more difficult for white with this move, h4. And while I hadn't mentioned this before, if white can manage to get a pawn on one of the h files or the a files, in which case the promoting square for that pawn is h8 or a8, even if white's king controls key squares like f6, g6, or h6, but if black's king can somehow manage to control the promoting square, then in this position, it is actually drawn. So Black's idea with h4 is actually to play h3 so that they can try to get white's pawn to take back so that it is on the h file looking to promote on the h8 square. Now, if white proceeds with something like king to f3, this is actually a mistake because black can play h3 and again, if white takes the pawn, then black's king will rush to the h8 square, in which case this position is drawn. The other alternative to playing pawn takes h3 is also g4. But g4 simply does not work out because white does not have enough time to actually take control of these key squares because black's king is going to get to it first. Black's king simply plays king to d7, white's king plays king to g3 king to e7, king takes h3, king to f6, and black's king will control these key squares in just enough time, and white's king cannot, thus resulting in a draw. So if we go back in this position, what does white do? Well, white can play this really clever move, king to g1, so that even if black plays h3, white can then play g3, declining taking the pawn on h3 and allowing the white king to move to h2, followed by taking the pawn on h3. Now, an important question to also ask is, well, what happens if white plays g4? But remember, in all of the scenarios we looked at so far, the white's king is in front of the pawn that is, it is trying to promote, right? So if we move the pawn to g4, it makes it harder for white's king to bring itself in front of this pawn because it has to move all the way in front to the g5 square as compared to the g4 square. In which case, if black can control this square, then black can effectively draw the game. So after g3, black can continue with something like king to d7. And so after king to h2, king to e6, king takes h3, king to f5, king to h4, king to g6, king to g4, 
Now, white has gained the opposition, but notice that this is for the fourth rank, not the fifth rank, which was what we were looking at previous positions. Here, it still doesn't matter whether it, what flank it is, whether the fifth flank or the fourth flank, because white is still winning in this endgame because they can reach one of the key positions and gain the opposition. So if black's king, say, moves to f6, white's king can play to h5, king to f7, g4, king to g7, king to g5, resulting in a position where white has gained the opposition, black's king is forced to move, and white's king will control one of the key squares. Thank you so much. And if you enjoyed that, please do like, share, and subscribe, and stay tuned for our next exercise and analysis of our next endgame concept. Thank you so much.